thank you for coming this evening. Um, my history is more complicated than uh, father told before. I also graduated from the University of Trade and Economics before the Ukraine Catholic <laughs> University. Yes, and I have uh, education in chemistry and all this stuff. Oh, so, good. Like, <laughs> like my <mother. laughs> yeah. um, first, my first background was like technician, technician in English. Yeah. So. Um, I also ask you to be patient uh, to the mistakes uh, because English is not my native language, uh, but I will try to improve it um, uh, also. So uh, today' talk is um, I will talk a lot of about very abstract things, about maybe history, historical facts, and some canons and some territorial discussions, disputes. But uh, I think we always must remember that this. Ecclesiastical geopolitics always has two levels. It has the upper level of hierarchs, of uh, all these patriarchates, metropolitans, and it has also this low level. And uh, I think that the major consequences of this autocephaly uh, will be on that lower level, uh, on the level of ordinary people. I, I want to start my presentation with one story. Maybe you heard about that, but I, I will, uh, I will uh, recall it again. Uh, maybe you know that about one year ago, uh, one horrible event uh, happened in Zaporizhia, uh, when one man decided to commit a suicide. And he jumped out from the window, and there was a family walking around, uh, on the ground, and then, and when that man jumped jumped out from the window, he fell down and he killed a little baby. Uh, you can understand the feelings of that family, and when they when they arranged all the things that were uh, needed for the burial services, they went to the church, to the nearest church, and they asked the priest uh, to conduct the burial services. Uh, and when that priest heard that this child was baptized in Kievan Patriarchate, he denied to conduct the burial services for him. You can, we can only imagine the feelings of that family that uh, they didn't know nothing, I think, about the history, about the canons, about the Patriarchates, about all this stuff. But they, they had this horrible experience in their life. So, when we are speaking about the, the history, as, as I said before, about the history, about the canons, about all these canonical territories, about all these disputes and these discussions, we must always remember that this division in Orthodox Church in Ukraine was not only between the hierarchs, it was between the ordinary people, sometimes between the relatives. My wife is from the region Khmelnytsky, Khmelnytska Oblast, and her family was divided to Moscow Patriarchate part and to Kievan Patriarchate part. And they also had, and they also had such uh, experiences, maybe not so awful and so horrible like that one in Zaporizhia, but th there were thousands of such events like, like, uh, like in Zaporizhia. And, uh, but my talk, I, I will start a little bit with history because it is, it is very important. Not only because I'm a historian now, but uh, because also in, in, uh, all these discussions, they, they have uh, roots in history. Uh, and I will start with the very early history. Because since the introduction of Christianity in Rus, the Kievan Metropolitanate was the integral part of the Patriarchate of Constantinople and covered all the territories that were under the political suzerainty of the Grand Princess of Kiev. You can see that this territory included not only what today is U Ukraine, but also the whole Belarus, 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 the part of today's Lithuania, and the part of European part of Russia, today's Russia. So substantial, substantial changes in the ecclesiastical structure took place with the gradual disintegration of the Kievan state into separate principalities and with the bitter struggle for the Kievan heritage. Among the many successors of Rudik dynasty, 
In addition, after the Mongol conquest, uh, the rulers of the neighboring states were also involved in this struggle. The first unsuccessful attempt to divide the United Metropolitanate was made by Vladimir Suzdal Prince Andrei Bogolubsky, who wanted to receive from Constantinople a separate metropolitan for his possessions on the northern eastern outskirts of Rus. After the disintegration of Kievan states, the residence of Metropolitan was transferred to the Vladimir and Klazma, and then to Moscow. In western parts of the former Kievan state, which had found themselves under the Polish and Lithuanian suzerainty, you can see here uh, this man, uh, there also were attempts to create separate Galician and Lithuanian Ruthenian Metropolitanate. These, however, proved incapable of prolonged existence. But the final division of the ancient Kievan Metropolitanate took place after the secular authorities in Moscow refused to recognize the decrees of the Florentine Council in 1439, which had restored the unity of Eastern and Western Christianity and removed uh, Metropolitan Isidore who was favorable to the Union at the Kievan Metropolitan. In 1448, the Moscow Church unilaterally proclaimed its autocephaly, independence from Constantinople, uh, and in 1589, taking advantage of the decline of Greek Orthodoxy under the Turkish rule, gained the status of Patriarchate, which further strengthened the imperial ambitions of the Moscow rulers and their claims for the leading role of the Third Rome in universal Christianity. The Kievan Metropolitanate, however, continued to remain under the canonical superiority of Constantinople and covered the lands under the authority of Polish Crown and Grand Duchy of Lithuania and subsequently of the United Commonwealths. Two events of the crucial importance for the further development of religious life in Ukraine, the Brest Union in 1596, and the controversial perception which led to the confessional division of Kievan Church into those united with Rome and those remaining in subjection to the patriarchs of Const in Constantinople. The other event was the Cossack Rebellion under the leadership of Bodan Khmelnytsky and the subsequent wars which eventually ended with a new territorial division of the Ukrainian lands among Poland, Muscovy, Muscovy, and the Ottoman Empire in the second half of the 17th century. The religious factor was used during the Treaty of Periaslov in 1654 to justify the necessity of Hetman's passage with the entire Zaporozhian army, quotation with the land and the cities, under the high hand of the co-religionist Moscow ruler. Moreover, the Tsarist government immediately tried not only to subordinate the Ukrainian lands politically, but also to extend their ecclesiastical jurisdiction over them. Notwithstanding all these, the hierarchy and clergy of the Kievan Metropolitanate were determined to defend their autonomy under the slogan of preserving all rights and privileges. Thus, Metropolitan Sylvester Kosim, who presided over the Sea of Kiev, from 1647 to 1657, did not agree to acknowledge the supremacy of Patriarch of Moscow and twice refused to swear allegiance, allegiance to the Tsar. After his death, the bishop elected Dionysius Balaban from Lutsk as Metropolitan. Supporting Hetman Ivan Belovsky actions, Metropolitan Dionysius was forced to leave Kiev and to move to Hetman's capital, Chagrin, and eventually was recognized as metropolitan only for those dioceses which had remained with the commonwealths. In the territory controlled by Moscow, church life was headed by Bishop Lazar Baranovich of Chernihiv. This happened as a result of new arrangements with Yuri Khmelnytsky, in which it was already clearly stated that the metropolitan of Kiev submits to Patriarchate of Moscow. Basically, Baranovich himself became the local tenants, of the Metropolitan of Kiev by the direct inf interference of Prince, Prince Trubitskoy, the Russian Lutheran in Kiev, and also traveled to Moscow to approve his appointment. Over three decades, Baranovich became the local tenant three times. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm giving maybe.
reading too, too much of history, but then I will turn to the more modern times. Be patient. The dual power in Kievan Metropolitanate was not eliminated even after the death of Metropolitan Dionysius Balaban. All that year, the local clergy elected Yosef Nerubovich Tokarski, the loyal colleague of Edmund Petrodoroshenko, who took a firm anti Moscow stand in his place. Constantinople recognized him as a metropolitan only in 1668. After his death in 1675, the new head of the Kievan Metropolitanate was never elected. Its right bank of the Dnipro River side with the support of the Polish authorities was administered by the Przemyshev Bishop Antoni Ben Bernitsky, and on the left bank the local tennis was Archbishop Lazar Barnovich, who was sympathetic to Moscow. In 1683, the newly electric Archimandrite of Kievan Caves Monastery Lavra, Kievchevska Lavra, Barlam Yesinski, contrary to tradition, received confirmation to his authority from Moscow Patriot. A year later, in 1684, the candidate for a metropolitan throne was found. The former bishop of Lutsk and Ostrov, Gideon Svetospolk Chepertinsky, who satisfied both Moscow and New Hetman Ivan Samuilovich. This, um, Gideon Svetopolk Chepertinsky, uh, was a good symbol of opposing those united with Rome. Uh, for Moscow, it was a very good candidate. Um, so, officially, Gideon became a metropolitan in 1685. Very quickly, the local clergy understood that the council which had taken place in Kiev on July 8, 1685, had not only elected a new metropolitan. Since the choice was confirmed by the Patriarch of Moscow, Joachim, it became clear that there had no that there had also occurred a change of jurisdiction. The clergy of Metropolitanate generally did not want to, subordinate, to be subordinated to Moscow. However, their dissatisfaction and protest did not yield any practical, practical result. The newly, elected, the newly elected Metropolitan Gideon, for the first time in history of the Kievan Sea, departed for Moscow where on November 8, 1685, he officially recognized the supremacy of Moscow Patriarch. In 1688, the title Metropolitans of Kiev, Halic and all Rus was changed to Metropolitan of Kiev, Halic and all of Little Russia. And from 1767, his title was further narrowed down to the Metropolitan of Kiev and Halic. With Constantinople, the case was settled in May 1686. The Tsar's diplomats, <coughs> having obtained the consent of Sultan, Sultan's court for the bribe of 200 gold coins and 120 sable skins, procured the consent of Constantinople Patriarch Dionysius for the transfer of Kievan Metropolitanate to the jurisdiction of Patriarch of Moscow. For this action, the Patriarch was soon condemned and removed from the throne. And subsequently, the legitimacy of this transfer was repeatedly questioned by his successor. A particularly striking example was the granting of autocephaly to the Orthodox Church in Poland by Patriarch Gregory VII in 1924. Uh, his charter on autocephaly contains ambiguous assertion, as assertions regarding the jurisdiction of the Constantinopolitan throne over the Metropolitanate of Kiev. Quotation. It is written that the previous separation from our throne of the Kievan Metropolitanate and its dependent Orthodox churches of Lithuania and Poland and their accession, accession to the Holy Church of Moscow was committed not in agreement with legalized canonical degrees and did not comply with the agreement of the full ecclesiastical autonomy of Kievan Metropolitan, who holds the title of Exarch of Ecumenical See. Um, in the first decades after the resubordination of Kievan Metropolitan to the Moscow Patriarchate, its leaders were pupils of the local cultural and scholarly center, the Mohila Collegium. Moreover, its graduates largely affected the development of culture and scholarship on the territory of Moscow Tsardom, 
A large number of alumni of key even theological school occupied high positions in the Episcopal Church in Russia. However, from the beginning of the 19th century, the key even metropolitanate was headed only by ethnic Russians. The metropolitanate itself was reduced to an ordinary diocese of the Moscow Patriarchate. That is, it lost all signs of the autonomy and that it had had that it had had within the Constantinople Patriarchate. In addition, not only church administrative autonomy, but also cultural theological identity was lost. The original architect, architecture and other examples of church art and of the Kievan Metropolitanate were used by the traditions of synodal Russian church. The philosophical and theological Kievan tradition, born of the synthesis of the best achievements of the theological thought of the Byzantine world and Western Latin culture, culture was replaced by Russian theological discourse, which in the 19th century assumed an extremely anti-Western and anti-Catholic character. And now, a few facts about the more closer to us, to our time history. So, the first, like, the first wave of, of, of struggle for Ukrainian autocephaly begins with the Ukrainian National Revolution in 1917. Uh, in 1921, the old Ukrainian Sobor Synod was called in Kiev, the capital of the newly independent Ukraine, and the Ukrainian Autocephalous Church, Orthodox Church, was declared independent from Moscow Patriarchate. The Sobor delegates uh, chose Metropolitan Vasily Lepkivsky, he is on the photo, at the head of the church. The 1921-21 Sobor has become known as the first resurrection of Ukrainian Olesathos of the church. Uh, but actually it was like a, a Ukrainian church wasn't Olesathos before, so this is not a resurrection, this is a creation. It was a creation of uh, Ukrainian Autocephalous Church. But that act wasn't canonical. Because all, as I said previously, all bishops of the Ukrainian Church on the territory of the Ukraine, uh, they were all of Russian origin and no one wanted to, uh, to support this autocephaly. They all rejected to support uh, the priests and the laity who wanted this autocephaly church. So, a uh, priest decided to ordain the bishop by themselves. Um, it wasn't a canonical act because due to the canons of Eastern churches or, or to, due to the canons of Catholic church, the bishop should be ordained by the other bishops, two or three or more, but uh, there, were, there were no bishops there uh, at, the, uh, at that church and they decided to ordain him by themselves. Uh, so priest ordained Vasily Lepkivsky. Um, this church wasn't recognized uh, by other churches uh, of Orthodox world, and uh, mostly all hierarchs of this church were killed in service by the Soviet authorities. Only one bishop survived in the United States, uh, Bishop Teodorovich. Uh, uh, I'm speaking about this first wave of uh, Cephaly. Uh, then during the World War II, when Ukraine was a battleground between the German and Soviet armies, Orthodox Ukrainians enjoyed somewhat increased freedom under German occupation. In May 1942, with the blessing of Metropolitan Dionysi, who was the head of the Polish Autocephalous Church, more than a dozen bishops were consecrated in St. Andrew Cathedral in Kiev. Um, in fulfillment of the uh, Thomas from the 1924 of the Ecumenical Patriarch. Uh, because this, this part of Ukraine became like a, closer to the uh, Polish Church, so they decided to consecrate these bishops um, if, uh, under the blessing of Metropolitan Dionysi. But there was also a parallel hierarchy of Moscow Patriarchate, and it was like they called it in history an autonomous church. Um, so after the Second World War, all the hierarchs who survived after the, this second wave of Ukrainian autocephaly, they went to the West. And you, um, 
know better than I the history of that church because it uh, last it uh, was here in Canada or in, in the USA and uh, one of the most significant hierarchs uh, of that period what period was uh, Mr. Slav Skripnik and you I think all, all of you remember him. Um, the new stage of history of the Ukrainian autocephalous church began on February 15, 1989, when with the support of pro-Ukrainian forces, uh, democratic forces in Kiev, an initiative committee was uh, for the restoration of, of the Ukrainian autocephalous church in Ukraine began, uh, was founded in Kiev. Its main purpose was to revive the Ukrainian autocephalous Orthodox church and to register citizens, uh, to register the parishes of that church. Uh, and the first priest, the former Greek Catholic seminarian, uh, Volodymyr Yarema, he was a priest uh, of uh, Peter and Paul Parish in Lviv. He was uh, the first one who uh, said that he uh, he is leaving the jurisdiction of the of, of the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, and that happened on August 19. 1989. So, and from that time, the autocephalous movement began began in, in Ukraine. And uh, I will skip a little bit. Uh, and you know that Mr. Slav Skripnik uh, visited Ukraine for, uh, as far as I remember, two times. And he was elected like a well, not like a but he was elected a patriarch of that Ukrainian autocephalous Orthodox Church. And uh, then a part of Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Moscow Patriarchate decided to unite with this Ukrainian Autocephalous Church. And the leader of that uh, unification was then Metropolitan Filaret Denisenko. Uh, but not all, or maybe it wasn't it would be not correct, not all, but only a few bishops supported him. Only a few bishops of Moscow Patriarchate supported him. As far as I remember, there was only a bishop Yakiv uh, from Pochayev, and also a bishop Andrei Andrei Horak from Lviv uh, that supported him. So, but they, a part of Moscow Patriarchate in Ukraine, and this uh, renewed Ukrainian autocephalous church, they united and formed the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Kievan Patriarchate. Here you can see the photos of all these people. Uh, but then a part of this new, <laughs> newly established church, um, there were different discussions within this church. There were different quarrels, even quarrels uh, within this new church. And uh, the group uh, led by the uh, then Volodymyr Yerema and uh, in few years he became a patriarch, Dmitry Yerema. This photo is um, on the right. So they split it from, the, from that given patriarchate and they formed again the Ukrainian Autocephalous Orthodox Church. So uh, in the middle of 90s in Ukraine there were three Orthodox denominations or three Orthodox churches. One Ukrainian Orthodox Church in communion, not in communion, but under the jurisdiction of Moscow Patriarchate. It was the biggest, uh, the biggest due to the uh, number of parishes, not uh, due to the number of parishioners, I think. Faithful. Faithful, yeah, faithful. So uh, the, 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 third, the, the second one was the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Kievan Patriarchate, and the third one, the Ukrainian Orthodox Cephalos Church. Um, and starting from the late 90s uh, and in the beginning of the new millennium, some, some discussions uh, started between different churches. Uh, firstly, among the Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Kiev and Patriarchate and Ukrainian Orthodox Autocephalous Church. And they signed a document uh, which was called um, which was called Symphoniticon. Um, in it, this, this document was written, uh, was signed in Constantinople, in Istanbul, former Constantinople. Um, and uh, 
I think that from that time we can trace the line uh, when the Constantinople decided to step by step to be involved in this process of healing of Ukrainian uh, of, the, of the division within the Ukrainian Orthodoxy. Uh, the next step uh, was made by the Patriarch of Constantinople in 2008 uh, when he was uh, invited by the president, then president Viktor Yushchenko to Ukraine. And uh, as far as we know today, that there were serious discussions about the recognition of the autocephaly of Ukrainian Church. Uh, we don't know all the details of that, uh, of, of uh, the discuss these discussions, uh, but uh, as far as we know, that uh, at that time, the uh, this autocephaly became more, you know, became more clear f f for for. Uh, for uh, for uh, for Ukrainian you know, society, uh, and uh, everything changed with the revolution of dignity and the war uh, when the uh, war uh, when the Russian Russian aggressions against Ukraine started. Here I, I put this photo, very famous photo when three bishops of Moscow Petrocade, uh, they, uh, they remained, they, uh, I don't know how to call this, they remained, they remained seated. Seated, seated, yes, when the whole parliament, when the whole Verkhovna Rada commemorated, uh, killed uh, soldiers which were killed uh, on the Eastern Front in Ukraine. And the, it, I, I can say from my own experience that the, um, the feelings of the society changed very rapidly in Ukraine uh, concerning the Moscow Patriarchate. Uh, a lot of people who uh, were before maybe indifferent to all these questions about the autocephaly, about the Orthodox Church, they were they were Orthodox but by name, by title, but uh, they were not uh, very interested in all this stuff. Uh, so a lot of people became very interested in that. I, I'm not sure that they uh, were very interested in different issues connected with faith, uh, but uh, they became very interested with, uh, with different questions about the independence of the church in Ukraine, uh, about the autocephaly. Um, and I think that helped uh, the Ukrainian parliament and uh, that helped also to the President Poroshenko uh, to push this question of the Cephaly in Constantinople because he had uh, a strong support of the Ukrainian society behind him and it was easier to speak with, uh, I think, with, uh, with Patriarch and the bishops of Ecumenical Patriarchate on that issue. And also one event happened in between, uh, between uh, our time and uh, 2014. It was a pan-Orthodox council on Crete, you know that the, the one of the biggest biggest ideas, biggest dreams of Patriarch Bartholomew was to convoke uh, the Pan-Orthodox Council. It was like a, a deal of all, of, all, of all his life, and uh, the the dialogue, the conversations uh, about this Pan-Orthodox Council started. I think in the middle of the 50s, uh, and they lasted up to 2016. And um, Petr Bartholomew wanted to see all the churches present at that at that meeting. And uh, we know that uh, one of the one of the questions uh, that Moscow Moscow Petrocade didn't want to discuss on that meeting was the question of autocephaly. Uh, and, uh, and they also um, asked, there was like a, um, what's called Umova? Hmm? Umova. Condition. Yeah, it was like a precondition. It was a precondition of their uh, involvement in that process of a pan-Orthodox 
Council uh, against the Patriarch of Constantinople not to force the question of Ukrainian autocephaly. Uh, and as far as we know, the Patriarch Bartholomew agreed not to push that question. But Moscow didn't come <laughs> to that meeting. And uh, after that, the Patriarch Bartholomew had his hands free. So, um, we also uh, know that there were a lot of, maybe not a lot, but some hierarchs in the ecumenical patriarchate that supported Ukrainian autocephaly for a long time. Uh, and uh, these uh, hierarchs are very close to Patriarch Bartholomew. So, we see that the event that, uh, as for me, I thought that I will never see the, Ukraine, the autocephaly of Ukrainian Orthodox Church in, during my life. Because this, the, the question is very hard. Uh, the question was very complicated. Uh, but something happened. And it happened. Uh, and but now I want to move from history to the current situation, and uh, maybe to to share with you not not to to state something, but to share with you my opinion about some maybe challenges of of this uh, of this uh, newly proclaimed newly established autocephaly. Uh, in Ukraine. Anatoly. Yes. Uh, sorry, just for us, for those of us who are a little less educated, autocephaly, what, can you define that term? What does it mean? Yeah, you know, the, the Catholic Church, maybe for, for, for the Catholics it's very hard to grasp what does it mean. But the Catholic Church exists like, a, like a one body with autonomous entities. Like our church is an autonomous church within the Catholic Church. The orthodoxy exists like a, they don't like to, to use that phrase, but they really exist like a federation of independent churches. So uh, they, 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 they don't want to, uh, to hear that, but they really exist like a federation. And this Pan-Orthodox Council showed us that they are not able at the, at the, current, uh, at the current period uh, to act like a one unified body. Uh, because not all churches uh, not all churches recognize the primacy of Patriarch of Constantinople, uh, the, uh, his primacy as a like a leader of uh, the world orthodoxy. So, is it? So autocephalus just means sorry, autocephaly means independence. Uh, uh, independence. Uh, 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 yes. Uh, 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 Autokephalos means that they have self head heading. Their, self -heading. They, they have their own head. Uh, the Orthodox also have some autonomous churches that aren't considered completely autocephalous. For instance, the church uh, in uh, Japan is, is an autonomous church under the Moscow Patriarchate. Yes. It has certain autonomy, yes. but it is not autocephalous. Yeah, would, uh, would an equivalent be Suiotis? No. Uh, su autonomous actually means uh, uh, Suiotis is the Latin term for autonomous. Uh, it's it literally means the same thing. Auto nomos sui iuris self governing. Whereas this is more than just self governing. This means that it that they are completely independent and have their own uh, uh, their own head, the head of their church. Yeah, but the reason th there are different understandings of that autocephaly because for Moscow autocephaly means total independence. That no one can uh, can inter in, intervene into your church, uh, and uh, that was the main point of their like, discussions with the Constantinople, uh, because for the Constantinople, the Sephali isn't a total uh, independence, because uh, uh, patriarchs of patriarchs of Constantinople they see themselves as a uh, they're like a primus inter pares, and they, uh, and they... First among equals. Yes, first among equals, yes. Uh, and they uh, see themselves like, a, uh, like a, the, the last, the last uh, arbitrary... Uh, Ar 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 
arbitrary. Arbiter, or arbiter or in, in the orthodoxy is that uh, that different churches and different bishops or even priests can appeal to them if they have a, uh, some like uh, uh, issues, yeah, within their own churches. So within the orthodoxy, the reason the uh, there are at least two interpretations of what means autocephaly. Uh, and uh, maybe a, a few points also I, I will add to, to the history, because uh, during the discussions we heard the, that Constantinople said in the, the act of the 17th century was uncanonical. So we restoring our jurisdiction over the Ukrainian church. So it was maybe from the formal point of view uh, uh, a good, a good uh, step, but uh, as a historian I see that the documents of 17th century are very complicated uh, and appeal to the history is not very useful, uh, was very useful in, that, in this situation. But the pastoral argument uh, that Constantinople issued during this process was, I, I think, was the strongest one. Because what, what did, he, did he say? He said that during the 30 years there was a division in Ukrainian Orthodoxy. And Moscow Patriarchate had 30 years for resolving this question. And they did nothing. So, we, we, we want all these people, millions of people, to be in communion with the world orthodoxy. And so we want to help them. So I think that, that argument was the strongest one. Because uh, that argument was about those people that I mentioned uh, at the beginning, uh, in Zaporizhia or in different, different villages and cities in Ukraine. So, but, uh, as I said, I want to share some of my maybe opinions, not, not statements, about the challenges of Ukrainian autocephaly that we see today in Ukraine. Maybe not, not uh, here in Canada, but in Ukraine we, uh, we see also some challenges with, with this process. And the first one is, the, is about the church-state and society relations. Uh, we all see, we all saw that uh, the government, the president, uh, were, were very involved in all these processes. And we, all, we also see that today the president, uh, I'm, no, I'm, not, uh, I'm not speaking against or uh, for him now, but we see that he is using this question in his electoral uh, campaign. Uh, we see the pictures on the streets, uh, I'm receiving them from Ukraine, so, and uh, we see also that this new Orthodox Church uh, is not so strong uh, that uh, it, be, it will um, say something against, against uh, using them in politics. And uh, Ukraine is a multi-religious and multi-confessional state. And uh, I think it will be very dangerous to have a one state church now uh, but we see that there are some tensions uh, uh, for that in Ukraine. Uh, and we know also that among the Orthodox hierarchs in Ukraine, this idea is very popular. Because a lot of them, they like the picture uh, like, like they see in Georgia or in Russia, where the Orthodox Church is a privileged one. Uh, and when this, is, uh, this church is uh, like a state church, uh, we know that they have such feelings, and we know that uh, they are not so strong to, uh, to, to stay against that. So, and the third question I put here, not the church-state uh, relations, but also church-state-society relations. Because in Ukraine we always have this triangle, because uh, I'm speaking as a Greek Catholic, we always saw themselves that we are with the society and a partner with the state. Uh, during our history, this modern history, the, and, uh, we, we, during the Orange Revolution and during the Revolution,
dissolution of dignity, we saw that uh, when the government um, is trying to push some, you know, undemocratic or uh, un pro-Russian politics, the society uh, and society w wants to uh, uh, to struggle against that. The churches are were always on the side of the society, and uh, I'm not sure that. Uh, this Ukrainian Orthodox Church, Autocephalous Church, is aware of that, uh, that tomorrow the president might be other man. Uh, or other, uh, or, we, <laughs> or women, yeah. And the politics might, might, might change. Uh, and, but, but they, uh, will they support the, uh, such politics or they will be on the side of the society with the poor people or with the marginalized. Uh, I'm not sure that they, that they uh, see that uh, challenge, even see that challenge uh, within their church. Um, next challenge is the unity of orthodoxy in Ukraine. Uh, during the last 30 years, the, uh, uh, there was a division in Ukrainian Orthodoxy. Uh, today, the Patriarch of Constantinople said that, uh, starting from the uh, Council, there is only one church. But the division still exists. Divisions uh, between different jurisdictions, of course, but also divisions between people. And uh, uh, I think that these divisions between people and jurisdictions, uh, they, they cannot be healed by the signing of some document or uh, convo convoking of, uh, of some gathering. This is a very, very long path and long, long process. And uh, this is the, the second big issue and second big challenge for the new church and for the whole society uh, to heal now all that division that emerged during these 30 years. And uh, that will happen not in one year, not in two years. I think that this, this path will last, this, uh, this process will last maybe for 10 years, for decade, not, no, not less. Uh, and, uh, Orthodox hierarchs, they, they need uh, to be very patient and uh, uh, they need to be very patient, I think that's all. And, and to be, you know, to understand all, this, all these people, because uh, today we see that there are a lot of priests and hierarchs within the Moscow Patriarchate, Patriarchate that want uh, to, to unite with that new church, but their objections, objection, objection, objections are against the former patriarch Philaret. They understand that this newly elected metropolitan, uh, this is a man of patriarch Philaret, and they they are scary uh, that this new church is just uh, another face of. Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Kiev and Patriarchate. Uh, I don't know how, how they will resolve this question. Maybe it will be resolved naturally in some time. But because I don't see any way out. Um, the next thing is relation with the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. Uh, Greek Catholics supported the process of, uh, of autocephaly. Maybe not uh, from that point of view, like from the ecclesiastical point of view, because um, we also s saw different danger uh, things uh, that are uh, coming with this autocephaly. But we supported this autocephaly because in Ukraine, I'm speaking from, from my experience, because I came to Canada not so long ago, uh, because in Ukraine, uh, this process uh, of autocephaly was very close with the, uh, with the national uh, security. And I think that for most, for most Greek Catholics, this autocephaly is mostly the question of national security. Uh, because if you have an 
independent church separated from Moscow Patriarchate, you have less influence of Moscow Patriarchate in Ukraine. Uh, and we have seen that Moscow Patriarchate used and still using its church in Ukraine uh, for, for, for the Russian, for the Russian uh, political aims. So, uh, and uh, if today we uh, hearing that uh, the whole process of the autocephaly in Ukraine, this is a political process. Yes, but we didn't start it. <laughs> because they first started to use the church in their political projects of Ruski, Mir and, uh, and others. So, but as, as to the relations with Ukraine Black Catholic Church, we, uh, I think we can be um, uh, at, the, at that period, we, we can be uh, calm because uh, there was a meeting and uh, both hierarchs uh, said to each other very pleasant things, that uh, we want the cooperation, we want the ecumenical dialogue, we want, diff we want to establish different social projects and we want to work together for the welfare of our society. So uh, I think that we have, we, we can hope that we will have uh, a good relations. Uh, the problem before was that uh, these churches, Ukrainian Autocephalus Church and Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Kiev and Patriarchate, they, uh, when they uh, weren't recognized by the Constantinople as canonical churches, there was no possibility to have an official dialogue with them. Because Vatican, uh, Roman, uh, Roman See, uh, they wanted to preserve a dialogue with Moscow Patriarchate, so they didn't want to have uh, uh, any relations, official relations, with uncanonical communities. Today this church is recognized by the Constantinople and I think that uh, we can hope that the official dialogue will be established uh, uh, in Ukraine between Ukrainian Greco Catholic Church and Ukrainian uh, Orthodox. Orthodox Church in Ukraine. I put this picture, uh, maybe it's very provocative, but. <laughs> before that I, was, I, I spoke a lot of about different historical facts and maybe canonical territories and so on and so forth. But uh, the situation, the religious situation in Ukraine is not so good as we sometimes uh, used to see. Only 10% of Ukrainian population uh, attend churches during Sundays. In villages uh, it might be around 16. Of course, in Western Ukraine it might be 50 or more, but in general, in Ukraine, the attendance is very low. Uh, lower than in Poland. Uh, maybe in Galicia, in Western Ukraine, we have the statistics like in Poland, but uh, Galicia is only a part of Ukraine and not the biggest one. Uh, so, and the, in the regions where the orthodoxy, uh, when, where the orthodoxy has the um, dominant position, uh, the attendance is not, is not high, uh, and I don't think that, uh, that, they, be, that they will gain some uh, better statistics without uh, reform of their church life. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't think that guitars will uh, uh, improve that, but it was maybe provocative, <laughs> just a provocative picture for me. But uh, I think that uh, in, in, in a few years, in year and, and two, we'll see that autocephaly was a little step, only a little step uh, uh, for, this, for this church, and uh, it will need uh, to, to, uh, to make uh, uh, more, more, more steps to be a really you know, Christian community in Ukraine, uh, to, uh, to, to work with young people and to really to, um, to develop uh, Christianity on their parishes. Because today's situation is not, is not uh, pleasant. Uh, the, 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 the programs, the catechetical programs uh, on Orthodox parishes are, are not very bad. <laughs> Let's say that uh, in that way. And uh, uh, the secularization in Ukraine is, is going like in 
like in uh, other regions of Eastern Europe. So I think that after this autocephaly, <laughs> they will have the main challenge is the uh, reform of, of that church. Reform because most of the hierarchs and uh, a lot of priests were trained in Moscow uh, schools, in Moscow theological schools, uh, and uh, they are not prepared to work uh, to real to, to work with, with their uh, with believers, with parishioners, uh, their parishes. Uh, and I think that uh, in a few years they will understand that better that they need some reforms. Um, not the last one, but uh, will be one more uh, picture, and then I will finish. Uh, so, uh, as to the global perspective, um, the crucial issue today is the unity of, uh, of the uh, world orthodoxy. As you know, that the autocephaly was granted by the Constantinople, but up to date wasn't recognized by uh, other churches. We know. Uh, we know that the Church of Poland, Church of Czechia and Slovakia, Church of Serbia and uh, Church of Antioquia, they, uh, they don't want to recognize this new church. Uh, these churches are pro-Russian, uh, they uh, are like satellites, satellites of Russian Orthodox Church. Um, it's strange to, 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 to hear that the Church of, Polish, of Poland doesn't want to recognize uh, this new church because we know why the Serbs or uh, Antiochians do, uh, don't want to recognize. But what about other churches? Uh, we hope that the Church of Georgia, the Church of Romania, and the Church of Cyprus, and maybe the Church of Greece will recognize this new church in a, a few months or maybe in next year or something like that. But uh, the, the main struggle today is between Moscow and Constantinople on the field of world, world orthodoxy. Uh, I have read when I uh, uh, was in, uh, on the train uh, going to Ottawa, uh, so I have read the, uh, on the news that the Orthodox Church of America refused to recognize the, this new church. It's very interesting because Orthodox Church of America isn't recognized by the Constantinople. So it was very funny that uh, they said, no, we don't want to recognize this new church. And the last picture was... Okay, I have one minute. Um, so the Orthodox Catholic dialogue. Um, this is very, very complicated and very interesting question, because I have spoken yesterday with uh, uh, Carl Hedu, uh, 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 who is the uh, head of CNEVA. Uh, Cat Catholic here. Near East Welfare Association. Yeah. And he told me that he was in Rome, uh, and he spoke with uh, the representatives of the um, Pontifical Council for the Christian uh, Unity. Uh, and they are, you know, very astonished and they don't know what to do because they want to have a good relations with Constantinople and they want to have a good relations with Moscow Patriarchate. So they are still keeping silence. The Vatican keeps silence on that issue. Uh, the good sign was that the Conference of Bishops, of Roman Catholic Bishops in Ukraine, uh, they uh, sent their greetings to the newly elected Metropolitan uh, Orthodox Church in Ukraine, uh, but the Vatican uh, still keeps silence. But I think that we can we can imagine that in near future uh, they will establish uh, some some relations with the new church, and I think that this is a good opportunity for the ecumenical dialogue in whole, because up to today the Moscow Patriarchate uh, held like the monopoly. The monopoly on the Orthodox voice from the Eastern Europe. They they used to they they had spoken as the representatives of the whole Orthodoxy from Eastern Europe, and they always uh, we know that uh, as a Greek.
Greek Catholics that they always uh, used to say that the problem in the dialogue are these Greek Catholics and uh, the Vatican uh, uh, should firstly resolve this question and then we will have a very fruitful dialogue. I think that uh, the new voice from the new Orthodox voice from Eastern Europe can heal this, this dialogue uh, because we see that the relations between Greek Catholics and Orthodox, uh, this newly established Orthodox Church, are quite good. And uh, I think that it will show to the whole world, to the whole world that the problem wasn't the existence of Greek Catholic Church, that the problem was the politics. Politics. Uh, so uh, I, I, I have a little hope that that in the near future the Vatican will will establish some some relations with this new church, and it will help uh, to to heal the the whole ecumenical dialogue between Orthodox Church uh, and the Catholic Church. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. I guess I'll call you Professor Lewis because he has taught, and so he's a professor. Um, I wanted to also mention that uh, Anatoly is on a research fellowship with the Shubtitsky Institute, uh, formerly of St. Paul University and now uh, St. Michael's College, uh, University of Toronto, and that his trip to Ottawa was sponsored by the Ukrainian Profile Program, which is on Rogers Cable Channel 22, and so we're very, very grateful that they sponsored his trip, covered the costs of his trip to Ottawa. Um, now, it, uh, it's a question and answer period. If you have any questions you would like to ask Anatoly, um, uh, you're certainly welcome to do so. If uh, somebody wants to ask questions in Ukrainian, I can translate or vice versa. That's, that's kind of like why they asked me to be here, so I can translate. <laughs> <laughs>